You're listening to Agile Ideas, the podcast, hosted by Fatima Rabucci. For anyone listening out there not having a good day, please know there is help out there. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Agile Ideas. I'm Fatima, CEO at Agile Management Office, Mental Health Ambassador, and your host. This podcast is sponsored by Agile Management Office, providing high-impact delivery execution in an Agile era for scaling businesses. On today's episode, we are talking to Ashley Cooper. Ashley is a professional environmental photographer who spent 14 years traveling to every continent on the planet to document the causes and impacts of climate change and the rise of renewable energy. This epic journey was entirely self-funded through image sales to newspapers, magazines around the world. Ashley then crowdfunded £45,000 to self-publish the award-winning book, Images from a Warming Planet. Ashley's work has appeared on the front covers of most major UK newspapers and is widely used by The Guardian. His epic climate change journey took him to over 30 countries, often working in remote and dangerous locations. In this time, he's probably seen more impacts of climate change than any living human. Ashley also spent 28 years as a volunteer with the Langdale Ambleside Mountain Rescue Team and in that time has helped attend to over 800 rescues. In this episode, we're going to cover a range of different topics relating to climate change, including his views on whether we have hope for the future on the current pandemic and how that has impacted positively or negatively on the environment. And also how he managed to get his book in front of Pope Francis, Emmanuel Macron, Sir David Attenborough, to name a few. We'll cover off a range of different areas, particularly helping to create awareness based on his incredible story so far. So join me to find out more. And here is Ashley. Thank you, Ashley, for joining us today on the Agile Ideas podcast. I'm really excited to have you here. And I have a lot of questions trying to prepare for this, thinking about all the things I could ask. So hopefully we get time to get through some of those, but I'm really keen. And so thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Fatima. Well, as I um, mentioned just briefly before we kicked off, I came across your profile through LinkedIn, um, naturally being one of the world's most uh, leading network for connections and whatnot. And I was fascinated by your portfolio of work and actually hearing your story. And I thought, oh, I just have to talk to you, particularly because of what you've been doing, which we'll get into. To help our listeners, I just want to set the scene a little bit um, and ask you what inspired the project that you've or basically concluded recently of photographing the effects and impacts of climate change from all those years ago when you started? Well, I've, I've always been interested in photography. Um, a lot of that interest has been in the outdoors and the environment. And for the last 20 odd years, I've been a professional photographer. And around about the turn of the century, I started reading more and more about um, what tended to be referred to then as global warming, mainly in sort of scientific journals. And I kind of thought, hmm, this is really interesting. So I started reading more and more about it. And it was came at a time when I was looking for maybe a little bit more focus in my work as well, because I was doing a little bit of all sorts of different things in my photography. So I thought, well, why don't I organize a specific photo shoot to look at some of the issues uh, around global warming, climate change? So I spent three or four months planning uh, a month long photo shoot to Alaska to look at issues like permafrost melt, uh, glacial retreat, forest fires. And I had a, uh, the highlight for me was I had a week on this tiny little island called Shishmaref, really remote. More people climb Everest every year than go to Shishmaref. It's between Alaska and Siberia, home to 600 Inuits whose carbon footprint is tiny, so least responsible wow. for climate change, but most impacted by it. Yes. And their houses were just getting washed into the sea. 
because the sea ice that used to form around their island about late September time wasn't forming, and this is in 2004, wasn't forming till maybe Christmas time. So if they mm -hmm. had a bad storm came through before the sea ice locked to their island up, um, it was the, the storms were just knocking great chunks out of their island and washing their houses into the sea. And I was just mm -hmm. blown away by how in your face the impacts of climate change were in the Arctic at a time when very few people were talking about it. I would say 50% of the people I talked to about my plans before I went and, and af after I came back about what I'd seen, I would say around 50% of people reacted by saying climate change, what's that? Never heard of that. Um, and I mean, that would be inconceivable that you could have that conversation and get that response yeah. today. But that was what it was like back in 2004. And so I just thought, you know, this is something that needs further investigation. Uh, so I organized another photo shoot, this time down to Tuvalu uh, in the South Pacific to look at the impacts of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. Tuvalu will probably be the first country in the world to disappear entirely due to climate change because it's rapidly getting swamped by sea level rise. And again, mm -hmm. I was just blown away by, by its impacts and very soon after that started thinking about, well, maybe I should try documenting the impacts of climate change uh, on every continent. And it took me about 16 years to, to achieve that. Wow, amazing. What a remarkable story. So you just started with something small and then just blossomed into something so much bigger after all that time. And you've got a science background, is that correct? Well, my degree is in physical geography, so I kind of understand quite a lot of the, you know, what's going on in terms of kind of planetary processes, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. And, you know, you mentioned around, um, you know, the the least, the Inuits in, the, in that area and the least responsible, um, but the most impacted by it. We hear a lot of people fleeing, country, their, you know, their countries and going to the US and other places. Um, a lot of people, I think, make the assumption that that, that people are fleeing, you know, just violence, but ultimately they're also fleeing the impacts of climate change, like with droughts and, and whatnot, and not being able to live in the countryside anymore, having to move into the city and then having to leave their countries. Is that something that you have also seen in your travels over the last 16 years? And, and has, it, has it gotten worse in the more recent travels that you've done compared to 16 years ago? It's getting it's getting a lot, lot worse. Um, millions of people are on the move around the world now. Um, I went to the Greek, Greek island of Lesbos to document um, the Syrian refugees who were being mm. kind of illegally trafficked uh, from yeah. Turkey across to, to, to Greece so they could get into the European Union and, and flee the war. And people were saying before I went, well, you know, why are you documenting that? Because they're, they're refugees from a war. And I was saying, mm -hmm. well, actually, no, they're not. Um, I mean, they are, but but also ultimately, they are they are climate refugees because the Syrian war was just a knock-on of the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring started in Tunisia, and it started by people taking poor people taking to the streets who could no longer afford to buy food at the market because of the ongoing drought driven by climate change in North Africa and simple mm -hmm. you know, supply and demand economics. The uh, supply went down and down and down because of the drought. The demand is still there, so the prices go up. People can't afford it. So they took to the streets and protested. And that's what essentially kicked off the Arab Spring, which bounced around the Mediterranean. And it's also what kicked off the war in Syria. People, you know, thousands of people had to had to leave the land in Syria and move to the cities because they could no longer grow any, any food there because of the drought. Um, which is not something that he's talked about, but it's those mm -hmm. displaced people moving into the cities that were protesting on the streets that kicked off the Sir civil war in Syria. So there is a direct connection between some of these violent uh, events and some of these wars and climate change. Wow, remarkable. And they say that the, the number of displaced people globally is you know two, three times that of refugees um, at the moment, which is quite startling uh, as as it may. In terms of the your book, you, you talk about the science of client, uh, the science of um, climate change. Rather, um, rather, it's more of an art. The way that you kind of portray it with your photographs. Do you think that science tends to focus more on the environment and less on the human impact, which is more evident in your photos, such as 
the displaced flood children in the Barney refugee camp Malawi. I, I see a lot more of the human side of it in what you're doing and maybe less there's less focus on in the science space where they're, they're focused more on the environment. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the science is crucial because we need the science to drive our understanding of, of what is happening to our planet. So, so that is crucial. Um, mm -hmm. And I think um, a lot of scientists are, are getting a lot better at communicating that in a way that people can understand. But, but as humans, we're interested in, in other humans. You know, you, you open a newspaper and all the stories tend to be, you know, human related because that's mm -hmm. what we're interested in. So... Mm -hmm my take on it is if you want to effectively communicate the climate emergency then you need that you need to do that by telling human focused stories and that's mm -hmm. about you know going into areas where people have of houses have been washed away by floods or, or burnt down by forest fires or you know destroyed by landslides or whatever it might be whatever the climate change event is um, that has you know, a deleterious impact on, on humanity around the planet. And, and my job is to is to document that, to show how climate change really is ripping into and destroying the lives of, of millions of people around the planet. Yeah, absolutely. And, and looking at uh, some of the photos in your book as well, um, there's some quite confronting um, images in there. How do you deal with the confronting images that you see in your work and in your travels? Um, one really prominent one is is this I'm not sure how to pronounce it this Svalbard polar bear um, yeah. or or that of the refugees that are traveling you know to Europe in small boats so how do you how do you deal with the confronting images that you see and take every day it's it's difficult and it, you know it, it has an impact and you know you can't if I tell you that I stood on the beach in Lesbos watching these overcrowded boat loads of refugees um, you know risking their lives uh, mm. to try and get to a safe place. If I, I told you I wasn't impacted by that, I'd be lying to you. You know, it's it's just heartbreaking to see the signs of human misery that I've seen over and over and over again. And, mm. you know, take the floods, for instance. I mean, we get flooded out in the UK a lot, but we're a wealthy mm. nation. And although it's devastating for families who are impacted by it, most people have insurance will which will pick up the tab for putting their house back into good order mm -hmm. when i went to malawi to document the impacts of the worst floods that had ever impacted the country there you know thousands of people were killed by the floods over half a million people were displaced many of those people lost everything their houses were washed away their livestock was washed away and the very soil that they used for their subsistence agriculture was washed away too. So they were left with absolutely nothing. Um, mm. And it's just devastating to see that level of destruction and especially a level of destruction wrought on people who are not responsible for climate change. You know, most Malawians exist on a few dollars a day um, you know, they, do, they have a tiny carbon footprint compared to, to yours or mine and, and certainly mm -hmm. compared to, say, a North American. And so, you know, these are people that should, should be protected from climate change, but they are, they, you know, they're, they're on the front line of the battle against it and they're, they're not responsible for it, but they're suffering most because of it. Yeah, it's a really um it's really sad to sort of hear that and, and it's it's great to see, you know, you're trying to bring some of that to light with this book and also with the obviously the message and, and getting it out there. You you've managed to to get your your book in front of some really prominent people such as Pope Francis, Sir David Attenborough and others. How how did that happen? How do you get this book in front of those people? I mean it's an amazing book, but how does that happen? I just try and kind of think of influencers out there who can help spread the message and who I think, you know, will uh, take a look at the book, look at the images in the book and think, you know, well, if I didn't know that climate change was a huge problem before, I, I certainly know about it now. So I, I look to see uh, ways that I can contact some of these key influencers and, and get copies of the book across to them and sometimes that's actually I manage to make contact and they say yeah I'd love to get I'd love to see a copy of that other times it's just literally with people like Al Gore who is very very difficult to track down just finding yes. an address for them and posting a copy out 
Um, yeah. But a lot of the time, it's actually been contacting these people. Um, the Pope I had a direct connection to because a friend um, went to school with with one of his key aides. So oh, wow. uh, <laughs> I, I had a direct connection into the Pope. Um, so that was how I got the book to him. But uh, but yeah, it's different with kind of different individuals, really. But I just feel um, that, that there is an incredibly powerful story and an incredible incredibly powerful message in the images in the book and that yes. just needs to be seen by as many people as possible uh, so that it can motivate people to take the action that's needed to, to avoid the worst excesses of climate change. Yeah, it's incredible and I think, um, you know, people like Sir David Attenborough, for example, who I follow a lot, you know, he, he not only sort of talks the talk, but he actually walks the walk. I, I know a few other um, people we've had on the show who have been able to reach out to him with, you know, similar um, sort of stories, whether it's around tree reforestation or saving the animals and things like that. And, and it's really great to see that these people have been receptive of, but it is a fantastic book. So I can completely understand why uh, receiving one of those would have met, probably been something good for them for that day. You talk about your, um, in your book, you say that you believe that the earth speaks to something in every person. Can you expand a little bit on that? Well, I think part of the problem, um, certainly in the Western world, is that we have become utterly detached from nature. You know, we have built mm -hmm. our little empires of concrete and steel and you know, an ever growing number of people live um, in, a, in an urban or a city environment. And mm -hmm. for you know, millions of people around the world, they are completely disconnected from nature. Um, and yet, you know, humans are just one of many species that inhabit the planet. You know, we rely on the natural world to support us. All of our food, all of our wealth ultimately comes from the natural world. And we abuse that at our peril. And we are already seeing um, the disastrous consequences of taking the services that nature provides uh, to humanity for granted um, mm. and as well as obviously the the climate emergency that we've got at the moment we've got a biodiversity em emergency you know the number of species that are going extinct around the planet every year is deeply deeply troubling and and uh, with every passing minute we are destroying more and more of the natural world and we need that natural world to support us and it seems to me that it's kind of only when it's too late will we realise how important these natural services were to humanity? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, you know, you, you say it really well that the, the technology itself and the rapid pace of technology is pushing us completely away from nature. Um, you're right, you, some people can be, you know, at home working, we we're work, all working from home at the moment, particularly in Australia, we're in Victoria, we're in lockdown and we're, you know, basically don't get any time outside. So you often forget what's going on outside and like you said and particularly in the sort of city space you often forget without these sort of reminders and, and something that it, obviously um, seeing something like this with your story and your book has really helped um, and will help hopefully more people you know maybe make that connection again and, and be more aware. I think um, one of the things that I um, noted in, in your travels is that you have actually travelled here to Australia and you, in fact, were here in Victoria after the 2009 bushfires that claimed yes. 173 people, um, which is you know, quite a devastating bushfire. Again, I'm not sure if you're familiar more recently, earlier on in this year, 2020 has been a really crazy year for a lot of people. We had yeah. some significant bushfires as well that wiped out hectares. Um, have you have you seen um have you have you been here since 2009 and what was your um what was sort of the the observations that you had when you were here um seeing seeing the land here in australia yeah I'm, i mean i haven't been back since 2009 and um, it's actually difficult for me to to return to places because the the whole project was self-funded um mm. cost of around about three hundred thousand pounds Wow. by the sale of images into newspapers and magazines at, at a time when they paid an okay rate for imagery. Sadly, yes. that time is long gone. Um, oh. And it would be impossible for me to set off today and, and, and redo the project. It would be financially just not possible at all. And so, mm -hmm. I, you know, to, to go to the other side of the planet is a very expensive thing to do. And I need to sell a lot of imagery to actually support myself to be able to do that. So 
yeah. in the early days of the project, I could kind of make that pay by doing it once. But the reality is I couldn't afford then to like spend that sum of money again to go back to maybe get a slightly different set of images, but ones which wouldn't be economically viable enough for me to justify doing that. So I would love to be able to revisit a lot of the places that have been to because, yeah. you know, since 2004, when I set off, there will have been huge, huge changes. And it's really important important that people you know are still out there documenting that so I'd love to be able to do it sadly it's just not no longer economically viable for me to do that but when I was in Australia yeah I saw um, I went around to a lot of the places that were devastated um, by the fires there I met people who had survived the fires but otherwise who had been you know, horribly burned in them people whose houses have been destroyed by the fire so I you know I, I saw a lot of trauma uh, from mm. people impacted by that I saw a lot of the land that was in a lot of the forest that was uh, was destroyed by that and and actually although it seemed terrible at the time I mean that was a, as of nothing compared to obviously the the, the bushfires that Australia has suffered in, in in the last 12 months I mean they've been mm -hmm. absolutely devastating um, yeah. talk of something like three billion um, uh, three billion kind of uh, numbers of wildlife being wiped out or displaced in those wildfires as well as you know large numbers of people mm -hmm. and that's repeated round and round the planet and you know now well when I was talking about this when I was able to go outside and meet people doing my kind of <laughs> images from a warming planet um, lecture and slideshow one of the facts I would say to people is you know like, do you realize that an area the size of India is going up in flames around the planet every year and that's just one of the many feedback loops of climate change but actually that's out of date uh, and that will now be a larger area than the size of india given the amount of land that's gone up in flames in australia this year um, in the us in all sorts of other countries as well wow and so when you travel to the countries that you've traveled particularly in sort of more more of the remote areas do you work with guides in the area or, you know, do, do you, I'm assuming you travel with someone because I've seen many photos where you're actually in some of the photos. So how does that come about? Do you make connections in local areas and they help you show you around or what's that sort of process like? Yeah, mainly I'm traveling on my own. Um, one or two of the images with me and will have been self-timers probably. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, mainly, mainly I traveled on my own. But I, what I did try and do is I always tried to link up with scientists who were working in the area and were working on the issues that I was documenting because I felt it was really important. Although yeah. essentially, you know, Images from a Warming Planet is an art photographic book. The art mm -hmm. is based on the science. So it was really important for me to meet up with scientists who were working in those areas. So wherever I could, I would do that. And obviously I wanted to meet as many people as possible who were being impacted by the issues that, that, that I was looking at. So I, I would always do that as well. And what would you say has been the most memorable place you've been, either for, you know, an incredible photo or, or maybe some people that you met? What would you say out of all the places you've been, if you had to pick one, if you can pick one, that is? Yeah, so many places, really. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I live in a mountainous area and I'm, I'm drawn to mountains and I'm drawn to um, Arctic environments. I love the Arctic and the Antarctic and I've been fortunate enough to um, have three trips down to Antarctica now and I've got into some really really remote areas down there and it is just out of this world stunning it is changing very very rapidly uh, the Antarctic mm -hmm. Peninsula is one of the warmest areas warming areas on the planet um, mm -hmm. which is really really scary uh, but it, you know visually it is just utterly stunning and the wildlife down there is incredible as well and I suppose one of the nice things about um, visiting Antarctica to document climate changes because nobody essentially lives there apart from a few people in science spaces you're mm -hmm. not seeing the the trauma in a, in a local population you know who are impacted by that climate change because there's not really anybody there to be impacted by it um, I mean don't get me wrong you know Antarctica is the is the global cooling system for the planet so well when that starts warming it's deeply troubling and it will affect yeah every single person around the planet but people yeah. aren't there on the ground being impacted in a way like they are being flooded out of their houses in Malawi so in that mm -hmm. respect it's you know it, it's kind of a it's a great place to go 
sounds amazing. I've never been, but um, hopefully one day it's just, yeah, it sounds like really very light, you know, un un relatively untouched, if you like, um, based on what's going on elsewhere in the world. Um, About you, as untouched as the planet gets these days. Yeah, yeah, I think it would be remarkable. Do you ever do any, do you ever, while you're, whilst you're travelling with, I don't know what kind of equipment you take with you, but do you ever do any videos just for memories or are you just focusing on your photos predominantly? No, no, no. I, um, I did shoot a lot of video um, while I was doing the project as well, but probably only the second half of the project because the kind of professional digital cameras that were available when I set off to do this, the very first mm. photo shoot I did, I took a, um, a film camera and a digital camera with me because it was right on the transition period when photography was moving over to digital. But those yes. early professional digital cameras didn't have uh, sufficiently high quality video capacity. So I was just shooting stills. But as the cameras developed over time and got better and better video capacity for the second half of the project, I shot quite a lot of video as well. So how, how long how long would you be away for at times um, if you were you seem to be in a lot of places where big events have happened so for example the bushfires in Australia in 2009 and whatnot so I, I'm guessing you sort of plan you sort of do you plan a month you sort of a year ahead or like how, how does your planning process go when thinking about where to go and, and how far how how much time do you spend away from home in between visits to different countries? Okay, um, the the longest period of time I've been away for has been six weeks. So we're not talking huge periods of time. Um, and, and somewhere the other side of the planet, that would be five or six weeks. Uh, mm -hmm. So I could maximise my opportunity. And, you know, whilst I'm there, some more local things just locally in the UK or, or in Europe, maybe I would just be away for a week at a time. But maybe I was away for three months out of every, every year. And, and so I'd have like maybe three months planning a photo shoot, maybe you know, two two weeks, a month away, uh, and then it would take me quite a long time once I got back to kind of process all the imagery, do whatever mm -hmm. else I needed to do. Um, but it was all fairly planned. I, what I didn't really do is I did an ambulance chase. I didn't kind mm -hmm. of turn the TV on and, and suddenly see, oh my goodness, there's just been this monstrous bushfire somewhere and quickly you know, book an airline ticket and jump on a plane and go there and document it because um, I just didn't feel that was the right way to tackle uh, the project really. So um, yeah. so it was really well planned out in terms of probably three months, six months in advance thinking, right, what are the issues I need to cover next? You know, um, So it was looking at all the different I impacts that climate change is having around the planet, mm. looking at where the best areas were to document those, uh, and then try to contact people on the ground and arrange a photo shoot to go and see hopefully, you know, the the, the impacts of that. So it was it was rather than a sort of an ambulance chase approach, it was more of a kind of a planned approach to say, right, okay, well I've I've actually shot quite a lot of glacial retreat now, but where where can I see permafrost melt? Where can I now go and see sea level rise? You know, where can I go and see desertification? Um, mm -hmm. So all the different issues that you know are impacting humanity on climate change were were things I had to kind of plan into the project really. So I made sure not only did I, I document the impacts on every continent, uh, but I actually documented all the different impacts that, that that are obviously driven by climate change. So you did what every good project manager does and proactively planned out your project, which is excellent to hear. Maximise your time away. <laughs> Love to hear. And we've got a lot of people that listen to the podcast who are from project management you know, industry and, and they would be very happy to hear that. So <laughs> that's great. Um, one of the things I was thinking about is obviously with a lot of the images that I've seen and, and reading through your book, you've taken a lot of photos as, um, you know, of things that are physically um, visible. But when we look at things like the significant rise in CO2 emissions, for example, how do you catalogue the invisible, you know, effects of climate change such as that, if if at all? I, it's just, I mean, it's very, very difficult. I mean, it's obviously, you know, you can go and photograph power stations and, you know, emissions coming out of factory chimneys and things like that, that, that you know, demonstrate where the CO2 is coming from, from the burning of fossil fuels. So, I mean, that side is relatively easy, but I mean, obviously CO2 is, is invisible. So, you know, you can't actually, you know, photograph a piece of sky with so much CO2 in it. But it's, so it's yeah. more about looking at where, where that's coming from um, and documenting um, those, um, industries that are the kind of the worst offenders um, mm -hmm. in terms of 
driving the climate change. And, and that in itself was really interesting because, um, I mean, I've lost count of the number of times I've been um, stopped by the police, by security guards, by intimidated by people, because mm -hmm. the, the worst offenders um, in, in a climate change scenario, those who are pumping out the most CO2 actually really don't like somebody pointing a camera at what yeah. they're doing. So yeah. I was, you know, I was arrested by the Chinese army when I was in China documenting them building new coal-fired power stations. I was threatened by the Royal Canadian Mounted Police when I was documenting the tar sands in Canada. And they told me if I literally stepped one foot off the highway, they would charge me with trespass and lock me away for, for three months. Um, mm. So they really tried to intimidate me um, into not getting the images that I got. And if, if people don't know about tar sands, it's the, it's the most environmentally destructive project on the planet. It's, it's basically bitumen and there's a way you can turn it into a synthetic oil by adding chemicals to it, but it's driving the second fastest rate of deforestation on the planet, second only to the Amazon rainforest. And yeah. because of the way they mine it, um, it's got a, a carbon footprint up to five times higher than a normal barrel of crude oil. So from a climate change perspective, it's absolutely devastating. And it's also highly toxic and, and really polluting the environment uh, in which a lot of First Nation Canadians live as well. Wow, that's incredible. I was, was going to ask you, you know, what's been the most sort of scary event that you've been, but you've just described a few of them that I think would scare a few of us. So. Wow, that's remarkable. Um, do, you, yeah. do you think, sorry? I was going to say, I mean, the, the, there's kind of two sides to that aspect in a way, in that sort of, mm -hmm. you know, there were times of danger, and a lot of that was around um, the kind of human interaction. Most people where I was going into areas where they were impacted by climate change, I was very well received because they mm -hmm. understood importance of getting the message out there and people would you know work well with me when I was documenting what's causing climate change it was a bit of <laughs> a little bit opposite um, but then obviously there's kind of natural dangers as well if you you know I went up to sort of like 18,000 feet in the Bolivian Andes um, where yes. you, can, you, know, you can barely breathe is that but not not much oxygen or certainly if you don't uh, don't take your time getting up there um, and acclimatize first and I didn't have a lot of time so I didn't but, uh, but you know, I, I kind of broke through a snow bridge um, over a crevasse on the Greenland ice sheet. And if I'd have gone through it, that, you know, <laughs> the world would not have known where I'd disappeared to. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I came very close to being avalanched in the Himalayas. So there, there are objective risks when you're working in sort of alpine glacial environments. Um, when I was in Greenland, working with a scientist there, um, we're putting some dye in the meltwater coming out the snout of the glacier and if you measure the downstream dilution of that dye it's a way you can extrapolate how much water's melting off the glacier. So we were down below the snout of this glacier putting this dye into the river or the scientist was and I was photographing him doing that and about two minutes after we walked away from the snout this huge um, serac collapsed off the face of the glacier completely buried to the point we'd been about two minutes earlier uh, and sent like armchair sized pieces of ice whistling over the top of our heads and that, yeah that was kind of a little bit of a brown trouser moment really. Oh my goodness your wife would not be happy with <laughs> the least <laughs> travels how do you convince her to keep letting you go? <laughs> <laughs> well thankfully most of the time well all of the time I've come back unscathed but I have had a few um, yeah narrow scrapes shall we say. Oh wow, that's it. Yeah, that's incredibly crazy. But I think it, it's obviously you've got um, you've got a good uh, level of fitness because I I recall that uh, early on in your in your life you managed to do some incredible climbing in in Great Britain. And um, you want to tell us a little bit more about that expedition? Oh right, okay, yeah. I well. Actually, I, I spent some time in Malawi, um, which is a place I went back to document the impacts of climate change. But I spent some time there. I lived there for three months when I was uh, in my early 20s. A friend was a volunteer teacher in a school over there and I went to visit him and kind of fell in love with the country. And uh, But desperate poverty there and a lot of problems and a lot of... Um, 
a lot of different diseases and a lot of people suffering from leprosy there. And I saw some work that the British Leprosy Relief Association were doing. Mm -hmm. And so when I came back from Malawi, I thought, well, I want to do something to help. I want to raise some money for uh, to, to help tackle leprosy. So I, I kind of came up with this harebrained plan of, of attempting to become the first person to climb every 3,000 foot peak in Great Britain and Ireland in one continuous expedition, something that hadn't been done before. And there's about 313 of these peaks. And uh, it took me three and a half months to do it, which involved 1,400 miles of walking, about half a million feet of ascent. Um, back in 1986, this was, but it raised something like 14,000 pounds for British Leprosy Relief Association, which was enough to cure at the time about 1,400 people of leprosy. So that was kind of hopefully, you know, something positive came out of that. Oh, absolutely. Remarkable. And definitely probably boosted up your fitness for all the travels that you've done ever since then, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm still, I live in a mountainous area. I'm involved. I've been in uh, the local mountain rescue team for the last 28 years here. So I'm I'm always kind of running up and down the hills with a heavy pack on my back or stretching somebody off the hill when I'm not a, a, away working. So it, it keeps me fit. <laughs> Amazing, and and you know, with the rescue mountain rescue team that you've been volunteering for 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 twenty eight years now, what would you say has been the most memorable rescue, um, if you if you could recall one? Oh, the, the, lots lots over the years. I mean, a lot of you know, we but sadly we probably get about seven or eight fatalities every year, so they're always like tragic. Um, mm. But there's been some quite kind of comedic humorous kind of incidents as well over the years um, where people have just done something monumentally stupid but actually it's been recorded. <laughs> um, so I don't want to reveal too many details it might identify the individual's concern. <laughs> <laughs> we can leave it we can leave that there that's fine. <laughs> um, it's funny I'm sure there's uh, some very interesting stories but we'll, we'll keep that offline. Um, I think um, one of the things that I wanted to to touch on is you know we with everything going on around climate change and um, I'm learning certainly learning a lot more about it with with a number of speakers we've had in the last um, couple of years. Do you think it's it's a political problem to solve or an issue that can be solved by private entities and individuals? What's your thoughts on that? I think we're uh, in such a dire situation now that it, it will take absolutely everybody pulling in the right direction to avoid the worst excesses of climate change. You know, we're already seeing you know hugely negative impacts right around the, the planet, and those are getting worse and worse with every passing year. So, it needs uh, industry working on this, and there, there's some really positive signs. Um, a lot of companies are doing really good work to try and lower their carbon footprints. You're mm -hmm. seeing uh, a lot of divestment around uh, around the planet. So big investment funds are pulling their money out of fossil fuel, investing it in, in you know in clean technologies, which is really encouraging. But it also needs um, it also needs the political will. You know, the Paris Climate Change Agreement mm -hmm. was groundbreaking. Um, but literally there is one country in the world that is mm -hmm. actually meeting its um, obligations under the Paris Climate Change Agreement at the moment, which means 200 odd other countries are failing miserably on that. Um, mm. So politicians really need to up their game. Um, obviously, you know, it's a disaster if people are electing politicians in places like the US and Brazil who um, choose uh, not to do anything on climate change because they would rather buddy up to their kind of fossil fuel buddies or who whatever the problem is um, mm -hmm. but you know it needs every politician working to to tackle this and it needs every individual to tackle it as well you know as an individual we can't do the big things uh, but mm -hmm. there's lots of little things that we can do um, everybody can take um, action to lower their own carbon footprint and that's you know fairly easy to do really uh, but for the big things that needs kind of concerted global um, government action but we need everybody pulling in the same direction absolutely and I think you know you mentioned early on as well that um, you know, early on in your expedition that some people probably wouldn't have really known much about climate change or really given it that much attention with such a sort of a rise in focus on climate change and, you know, even for individuals learning more about it and, and some of the, the things like the Paris Agreement, do you have um, sort of, are you optimistic about a better future or are you still very concerned? 
Um, depends how I wake up in the morning. Sometimes I wake up optimistic and otherwise not. Um, I think you, you have to maintain a degree of hope because if you don't, there's kind of no point getting out of bed in the morning. You know, there, mm. there are things that we can do and should be doing to avoid the worst excesses of climate change. And we really need to get on very rapidly and do that. And if people start doing the right things and if world governments start doing the right things, you know, we, there is still a little bit of time to avoid the worst excesses. But if people keep burying their heads in the sands or politicians keep burying their heads in the sand, um, then we're going to get to a point fairly rapidly mm -hmm. where any control will be taken away from us because there are so many feedback loops around climate change. Um, so the more sea ice that gets melted, that sea ice reflects the, the sun's energy back into space. But you melt that sea ice, the darker seawater absorbs more of the incoming solar radiation, which heats up more and more. Um, take the forest fires, obviously, you know, gigatons of carbon are being released into the atmosphere every time mm. a forest fire happens. So that's, you know, loading the atmosphere with yet more greenhouse gases, which makes the climate hotter and drier, which means obviously more forest is going to burn, you know, and these feedback loops just go on and on and on. You know, the permafrost is melting quite rapidly now. Um, methane, which is trapped in the permafrost in you know, gargantuan quantities, is mm. a greenhouse gas something like 27 times more potent than CO2. So if we start releasing huge quantities of methane into the atmosphere, that is, you know, we could end up with like a, a runaway warming scenario, which humanity will no, will no longer have any control over whatsoever. So it's really important that we, we try and do everything that we can, you know, in a very small time frame that we've got left before nature takes over. Mm. And it's really important, like you said, that it's a, it's not only a one particular area problem, it's up to everybody. I think individuals ourselves can probably play a part. Is this something that you can recommend for the everyday person who maybe wants to live more sustainably or, you know, reduce their environmental foot, footprint? Is this something that you recommend typically for the average person that maybe just wants to start doing better for the environment? There's loads of things that you can do. Um, I mean, the big one um, is, you know, don't fly or fly less. And, you know, I'm going to stick my hand up here. My carbon footprint documenting climate change around the planet was pretty hefty because a lot of the time mm -hmm. I was flying because it was the only place to get uh, mm -hmm. to, to a lot of these remote locations. But, you know, if you can fly less, that's a, that's a really good thing to do, you know, and I've, I've not taken a flight for you know over a year now. Um, if you can look at, for most people, the largest portion of their carbon footprint is in sort of powering and heating their house. And mm -hmm. in most countries now, there are energy companies that will supply your electricity only from renewable sources. So, you know, if you're concerned about climate change, if you're concerned about the future for your kids, you know, sign up to an energy company that's going to deliver you uh, electricity from renewables. So, you know, you're, mm -hmm. you're not keeping those coal fired power stations open. Um, you know, buy more local food. Don't, you know, don't be buying stuff down the supermarket that's been flown halfway around the planet, you know, because food mm -hmm. miles and agriculture is a huge thing. Um, also, you know, eat less meat and dairy because meat and dairy is has a heart you know a huge carbon footprint so you know not everybody's going to suddenly become vegetarian or vegan but you mm -hmm. know a lot of people in this maybe in the states have been used to eating you know red meat for breakfast dinner and and, and <laughs> eat meal seven days a week well just yeah. try one day where you don't eat meat that's a start um yeah. you know everybody can do something to you know reduce their impact on the planet um, solar energy is really cheap now. I mean, I've got solar thermal and solar PV on my house roof. So I heat the hot water with solar and, you know, most of my electricity, even though I live in an area which is fairly dull and grey and it rains a lot, um, three quarters of all the electricity that my house uses in a year comes from the solar panels on the roof. So if you yeah. live in you know, Australia, it's just perfect for solar because, you know, it's, it's so sunny a lot of the time. Um, Definitely. So in, invest in solar panels for your house roof because the prices have come down and down and down. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's a really economically sensible thing to do uh, to reduce your energy costs. And, you know, who, who likes spending money 
um, giving it to an energy company because essentially you don't see a lot for that. Whereas if you can invest a little bit up front in solar panels uh, for your house roof, uh, then you've got free energy going forwards, you know, forever and a day. So, you know, there's, there's hundreds of things that people can do to, you know, walk more, cycle more, don't jump in the car for every trip, you know, think about how you're going to get to places. Um, yeah, there's ama that's an amazing um, list of things and I think the one that you mentioned at the beginning around fly less, I was having a conversation uh, earlier this week with a colleague who, with organisations, the amount of travel that's now reduced because of the pandemic has been significantly dropped and I would hope that a lot of organisations realise that the need for people to travel as much as they were is no longer necessary with technology enabling us to do everything um, online. Do you, do you, have you seen or do you believe that there's some positives as a result, um, positive on the environment as a result of the worldwide lockdown that's sort of impacted us over the last year? I do. Uh, I mean, I'm sat in the UK, you're sat in Australia and we're talking via technology. Mm -hmm. I've got friends who work for companies that in the past would have flown that person from the UK to Australia to have mm -hmm. an hour meeting with somebody to then fly yep. back again. I mean, that's yep. utterly crazy um, yeah. when you've got the technology that means you can just sit at home. You don't even have to go into the office um, and you can have that conversation with somebody online. And yeah, there's been a huge rise in the number of people working from home. Um, I went on holiday to Cornwall recently uh, and one of my relatives works for Cornwall County Council. And mm -hmm. he was saying that the council is now saving um, a, mi a million miles a month, every single month, on just the staff that work for the council working from home and not driving in and sitting in an office. So that's wow. one little local council that's, you know, driving one million miles a month less than they were doing. So that's that's a huge win for the environment and a huge win for individuals because who likes to spend their time sat in a car if they don't have to? You know, we could yeah. be doing more productive things with our time. But the yeah. uh, so we have seen, you know, a, a, a reduction in emissions um, during the COVID pandemic. But the reality is we need mm. to see more of the reductions we've seen through COVID going forward every year, every year, every year, every year. And at some point when this awful pandemic is over, you know, mm -hmm. this element of going to be returning to business as usual. I hope mm -hmm. that is the case, but some things will return. You know, people will start jumping on an aeroplane and taking their summer holiday abroad again. Um, yeah. But I hope some of the things will be locked in, like businesses thinking, well, why do we need to get people to drive into the office to do the job when they can e do it equally well sat at home? So a lot of these things, a lot of technology can drive um, a, a lower carbon footprint for, you know, for, for billions of people. Well, let's hope so. Let's hope that moving forward, they realise that it's not necessary to do what they were doing before and, you know, consider it um, a change as moving forward. I heard recently that in, in New York City, some organisations were saving $15,000 a year uh, you know as a result of with people working from home that they could reinvest into something or you know reduce their their um their carbon footprint as well in office space and and commuters going in and out of the in out of the the city so hopefully moving forward um companies decide to keep this i'm sure they've saved a lot of money at the same time so we'll just have to wait and see and, and it you, makes for way more pleasant environments for people to live yep. in because who wants to live in an environment where your street is choked with traffic and pollution mm -hmm. from from car exhaust you know it's not good for for human health you know, yep. millions of people die around the world from the mm -hmm. impacts of inhaling air pollution every year so fossil fuels aren't just bad for from a climate change perspective they're disastrous for for human health yeah absolutely i 100 percent agree with you hopefully more people decide to take action i think your book is a powerful call to action to help drive people um to a better path moving forward definitely taking on on uh taking note of all of these points that you've shared as well now that you've delivered this really important project tell us about your newest project i believe it's called i commit it is um i kind of spent 16 years documenting climate change and I put together the world's single largest collection of climate and renewable imagery 
what mm-hmm. I'm one person. And, you know, there's a, obviously a huge limit to what one person can do. And I'm kind of almost out of business as a, as a documentary photographer these days because it's really difficult to make it econ- economically viable and make it pay to make a living out of it. And the reason for that is that, you know, the world has got a camera. You walk into mm-hmm. the poorest communities on the planet and half of them will have a mobile phone that's got a little camera on it. And mm-hmm. so the world now is swamped with imagery, which is why the rates for, for selling professional images have, have collapsed. So on the one hand, I've been kind of negatively impacted by that. But on the mm-hmm. other hand, I'm now thinking, hang on a minute, there is a huge opportunity here. You know, why do I need to kind of get on a plane and fly to Australia to document forest fires when mm-hmm. there are, you know there are thousands of people there on the ground already all of whom if they haven't got a camera they've got a mobile phone um, that can take pictures so wherever um, a disastrous event is happening around the planet due to climate change people are documenting that they're taking photos on the, on their phones and i just think wouldn't it be fantastic if we could set up an online portal where people could down you know via an app, download the images that they've taken that show the impacts of climate change in their own backyards. And then over time, hopefully that will build up into a massive global database of how climate change is radically um, altering the planet. So um, I want to set up this thing called iCommit. Um, I've got a crowdfunding campaign. I need to raise about £50,000 to, to actually get the design work done and the, and the apps designed and, and, and the computer space to do it. Um, and uh, what I would like to be able to do is to launch this um, maybe for the, 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 the delayed COP meeting that's taking place in, in November. Uh, in the UK next year and I just think from a scientific point of view and and an educational point of view it will be an absolutely priceless resource for the world to have for people to just be able to go on and to be able to you know at a click of a mouse just to be able to see what all these dreadful impacts are that climate change is driving right around the planet in every single country so that's that's kind of what I'm working on at the moment. Sounds like another really interesting project that uh, no doubt will be beneficial, particularly with people submitting photos into this online portal and seeing maybe the 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 size and scale of the photos within each country or region or continent, just to kind of give you know politicians and leaders people that can probably influence the change faster than the individuals on our own to see what the impacts are in their areas. Maybe that will be a lot more um, high impact, particularly because they'll the, it, as as soon as someone starts um, contributing to it, it will no doubt continue to grow um, globally. So hopefully you do get that uh, uh, crowdfunding. And if you um, share that link, we'll put it in our show notes as well. If anyone wants to contribute to that, um, it's a very worthwhile project. So hopefully that um, continues to uh, grow and prosper over the remaining part of the year. I do have a, um, a just a left of field question. What do you never travel without? You've traveled so many places. Is there, other than your camera, is there something else that you just <laughs> never travel without? <laughs> it can't be the camera. <laughs> I, I, I think a sense of adventure. I think, okay. you know, you've got, you've got to go into places with, although I plan very carefully for my photo shoots, you've got to take a sense of adventure with you and you've got to travel with an open mind and Mm -hmm. because you know you might have thought that you know this is you know one to ten images i must capture while whilst i'm here because that's what i've planned that's what my research says is the important issues this is what i must cover but you need to be open to opportunities because there might be something that you hadn't read about beforehand that you hadn't planned and you know opportunities present themselves and you need to be open to to taking advantage of those opportunities so travel with an open mind travel with a sense of adventure and you know make the most of of every kind of expedition that you do um so yeah that that, that's the other thing that i I always travel with just if i can going back to the i commit i I should have said the other thing sort of will be in two parts really one will be you know um people uploading the impacts of climate change but the other part of it is they will also be able to upload the images that show the good things they are doing to lower their carbon footprints, the solutions, because it's really important that people see the solutions and what we can all do to to benefit the planet. Um, So it will be a a, a dual thing, one showing what's happening as a result of climate change, two showing what we can do about it. 
Amazing. That's really, yeah, really clever. I think um, there'll be a lot of people that will be willing to put their hand up and put some photos in there of that. So that's yeah, really positive. Um, we are almost out of time. Um, I wanted to let everybody know that they can go to www.globalwarmingimages.net and I will include that information in the show notes so they can go and purchase your book right now. Before we go, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners, a call to action, a piece of advice or a question to ponder? Right. I would just say, you know, make yourself aware of the facts. Please go out there. You know, the, the, you know it's really easy to find out the facts on climate change. Just educate yourself. Realise that it is the greatest threat that humanity has ever faced. And unless we tackle it really rapidly now, um, humanity does not have a very good prospect for a, a healthy future on this planet. So educate yourself, um, start talking to your friends and family about it, start lobbying your politicians to do more about it and just get active in a climate space so that you, know, you become part of the solution um, rather than part of the problem. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ashley. I really appreciate your time. I um, really enjoyed talking and learning a lot more about this. And I'm hoping that everybody else listening will not only get on board with iCommit, purchase your book, but also um, connect with you in the social links that I will share also in the show notes. So thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure, Fatima. Lovely talking to you. Hi, guys. Just a few things before you leave us. All of the information around how to get in touch with Ashley Cooper, purchase his book and be involved in his new endeavor can be found in the show notes. You can catch Ashley at Twitter at Ashley Cooper GWI. If you'd like a copy of the book, you can go to www.imagesfromawarmingplanet.net. Or if you would like to get involved in helping the environment by supporting his initiative, go to gofundme.com forward slash the letter I hyphen commit, C-O-M-M-I-T. That's gofundme.com forward slash I hyphen commit, C-O-M-M-I-T. All of this will be in the show notes. Be sure to check it out. To stay in touch, please go to www.agilemanagementoffice.com and reach out if you've got any feedback, questions, or anything further that you would like to share. Until next time, bye guys. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We welcome any feedback. Please let us know by going to www.agilemanagementoffice.com forward slash agile ideas. You can also find us on most social media channels by searching agile ideas or follow me on LinkedIn. Thank you for listening. Please share or rate this if you enjoyed it. I hope you've been able to learn, feel, think, or be inspired today. Until next time, what's your agile idea?